So SPECT modules have come up a lot, but I haven't seen a definition. So I'm going to start at the very beginning and define them because the problem is very Thank you. So, a uh, problem is very sensitive to which uh, modular reduction you use of the uh, simple characteristic zero module. So, I want to start at the very beginning and define everything. So, uh, sim A will be the group of permutations on a finite set A. And because I'm not skillful with these large curly S's, sigma D will be the symmetric group on one up to D. And I have a partition and the corresponding of D, partition of D, and the corresponding young subgroup Sigma lambda, that's the symmetries of the first lambda one numbers across the symmetry of the next ones, and so on. So um, we have the permutation module M lambda over Q. And as everyone knows, this uh, decomposes into an irreducible module, and this parameterizes the irreducible, the Specht module of the Q plus the sum of Specht modules with mu greater than lambda. So, uh, we also have the permutation group over Z, per permutation module over Z. And we get uh, the Specht module over Z by just intersecting And once we have it over Z, we have it over every field. And the field should be characteristic P. That's what I'm interested in. This will be the tensored up version of the Specht module of Z. And uh, just for good measure, the permutation module over K will be denoted M lambda. Good. So that's everything defined. And, okay, so it's usual to remark that the Specht module for D itself is a trivial module. And the Specht module or one to the D is the sign. So what I want to uh, tell you about is the following theorem. Which is a complete description first cohomology group of Specht modules, uh, at least for characteristic bigger than two. So 
Oh, just to be explicit, uh, what I mean is, i.e., for which uh, partitions lambda this is non zero. And when it's non zero, what is its dimension? in terms of the partition lambda. So what are we actually doing? Well, this is the extension group between spect module and uh, trivial module. So it's all extensions up to equivalence. So all the ways of sticking a copy of the trivial module on top of the uh, spect module. And I said this is very uh, sensitive to the choice of the reduction mod p, because in particular there are no extensions in the other direction by contrast. All extensions. Split for p is bigger than 2. So this is the real problem. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, H1, but of course before H1, there is uh, H0. So we should take, take a step back. So we call a two-part partition AB two-part partition AB James if B is less than P to the power, the valuation, the periodic valuation of A plus 1. So that's just the number of times P divides M. Uh, this means uh, that you can write A in the form a power of p minus 1 plus p to the r times, say, a bar, with uh, b being less than p to the r. So, way of thinking about that, but there's another way of thinking about it, which is even better from our, our point of view. This is equivalent to a plus i choose i is congruent to zero mod p for all one less than or equal to i less than or equal to b, as you easily see from Lucas's formula. That's a two-part partition. And so a general partition will be called gems if each consecutive pair in the partition is James. If each pair, lambda i, 
Lambda I plus 1 is James. So the result in degree uh, 0, proved by James, surprisingly, is that the 0th cohomology, OK, that's just the fixed points, It's either a one-dimensional space, if lambda is James, or it's zero if lambda is not James. Of course, James didn't state it like this, because he's too modest to, uh, to say it like that. <laughs> but uh, Stewart's remarks about the advice James gave him about this symmetric group reminds me of what I heard a long time ago in a lecture by Gordon James. Though, to be honest, it's so long ago, it's not sure that I didn't just dream it. Uh, what, what I remember was the phrase that the trouble with the symmetric group is there's too much symmetry and not enough group. I thought it was quite prof profound, and I asked him about it a few years later. He said, oh, he didn't remember, but he didn't want to disown it. So there you go. So that's the symmetric group, but our method is to work via the general linear group and the uh, Borel subgroup. So we choose n greater than or equal to d, and take the general linear group and we might as well take k to be algebraically closed. So this has its uh, natural module of column vectors and it has a basis, EI, the standard basis. <clears throat> now, there is the Schur functor, which was mentioned in <coughs> Ming Fang's talk. It goes from polynomial G modules, homogeneous of degree, degree D, to modules for the symmetric group. And I'm assuming here that D is less than or equal to N. Oh, I have that assumption up there. And um, at the level of spaces, uh, you can think of it as just taking a certain weight space, weight space, a one, 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 one weight space, with some extra zeros, I suppose. Or, as uh, Ming Fang mentioned yesterday, it's also the space of homomorphisms from the tensor power to V. So if we have a partition lambda D, I'm going to use this notation, S upper lambda D, up S upper lambda E, rather, for the tensor product of the symmetric powers
And uh, the first thing you can say is if you apply the Schur functor to this, you uh, recover our old friend, the permutation module. And the philosophy, as uh, explained in Green's book, is that you should take something nice in the general linear group, apply the Schur functor, and you should get something nice in the symmetric group. So the other case we need is the, uh, to do this to an induced module. So we take B to be the negative Borel subgroup. And then uh, lambda gives a one-dimensional B module let's say it's K lambda, with an element T1, Tn star, <laughs> acting as multiplication <coughs> by T1 to the lambda 1, Tn to the lambda n. Uh, so the other module that comes into the frame is the <coughs> induced module. So there's a theory of induction in algebraic groups, and this is the induced module. And uh, it's a very friendly object. It's finite dimensional, and its character is actually Schur's symmetric function. So what happens to this when you apply the Schur functor? Whenever you see a module of the general linear group, you should ask yourself what happens when you apply the Schur functor. And uh, what happens in this case is that you get the Specht module. So that's sort of our way into the, the problem. And the next thing we need to know is a comparison of the uh, X groups. Well, I only need the, the first Right, this requires p bigger than 2. And in most cases, it's, uh, it follows from Kleschev and Nakano. So the careful reader will note this is not quite covered by the result that Ming Fang mentioned yesterday. So we need an extra argument to deal with uh, the case P equals 3, though it's, it is a general argument. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, uh, on the other hand, lambda gives a line bundle, L lambda, on the projected variety G mod B. And uh, the, uh, the global sections, and in fact, this is just a matter of definition, it's just uh, nabla lambda. Uh, but the interesting uh, bit is that one has uh, Kem's vanishing theorem.
And this has an application, which is a consequence noticed by uh, Klein, Parshall, Scott, and Van der Kallen back in the mid-70s. that this extension group that we're interested in is uh, the B extensions of the symmetric power by K lambda. So this looks quite fancy, but in fact, since it's type A, it's easy to do this without any, any algebraic geometry. Anyway, together with the previous uh, result, which is called star, we're reduced to calculation of, uh, well, here's on the left-hand side, it's the thing we're interested in. And on the right-hand side, it's the B-module extensions of the dth symmetric power with uh, K lambda. So let's just be clear, what we want are our all B-module extensions so all the ways we can stick a K lambda underneath uh, the symmetric power. So that's the point. That's the strategy. Because there's no more fancy stuff. So now you put all your all your cohomological tools back in the cupboard. And just stare at this. Unfortunately, we had to stare at this for about eight months. Right, so how do we get hold of this? That's the next question. So that's very concrete. We just really actually work with these extensions. No more fancy exact sequences or anything like that. No more functors. We're just interested in these uh, extensions. OK, so how do we get hold of uh, these? So we have these uh, root elements in the Borel subgroups. Say x, r, s, u.
and we use these to define uh, divided power operations. So if we're given a B module, then you get uh, uh, these divided power operators. <laughs> Let's call them X, R, S, I, on V. Defined X, R, S, U on V is the sum X, U to the I, X, R, S, I, V. So these are really the same divided powers that appeared in uh, Anna Paula's talk yesterday. So here we have R greater than S. We don't like that. We'd much rather have um, R less than S. If we're working along the rows of the partition, this is much better. So the, these together with the, the torus, the diagonal subgroup, generates B. Yeah. These are generating the, uh, the negative part of the hyperalgebra, if you want to formulate it like that. But I just said for every module V, you get this operator on V defined in this way. But that's the full story, and that's quite important, because at some point you have to say what the generators and relations are. That <clears throat> turns out to be quite important. Anyway, but what we don't like is this condition R greater than S. We'd much rather have uh, R less than S. So there's, there is a recourse. We just define Y R S to be X S R. And now R can be less than S. And somehow we like that much better. <laughs> Simple point, but it, I, I think the combinatorics works out better. Right, so anyway, this is the problem that we're up against. And so let's just uh, focus on that. And I said we're not going to do anything else fancy. We're just going to look at this problem straight in the face. So if we look at the dth symmetric power... This has a basis, E alpha, which means E1 to the alpha 1, En to the alpha N, where the alphas add up to D. This is living inside the symmetric algebra, and this is the, this is the basis of monomials. Yes, this is just a polynomial algebra, and E1 up to En, and we're looking at the degree D part of it. So these operators are very obliging on these, uh, on, on these elements. Here's the action. Alpha R choose I, E alpha minus I times epsilon R minus epsilon S. So epsilon R is this row vector <coughs> with a 1 in the rth position. The point is that these coming from the negative Borel, they're pushing down the weights. If, if you regard this as a module for T, it has weight alpha, and this pushes it down like that. And uh, perhaps I should say I less than or equal to alpha R, but I wouldn't really get into trouble if I didn't, uh, and zero otherwise. So it pushes it down if it can, and if it can't, it's zero, but that would be zero anyway, so... That's no big deal. <clears throat> so
So what can we do? Suppose we have a sequence. Suppose we have a sequence. B module sequence. Called Dagger. <coughs> right, what can we do? Well, we can choose the, a basis of V in a nice way. So we choose V sub alpha in V mapping to to E alpha. And there's one other basis element to uh, to fix, and the other one we'll call V infinity. in the image of uh, K lambda. So there are the ones that are mapping onto the E alphas over here, and there's one extra coming from uh, K alpha. Then what you find is, if you apply a YRSI to a V alpha, There's really only one bad case, so let me write down the other case first. The only ambiguity is when you push down from alpha and you reach the weight Lambda. Now, lambda can occur in two ways, either from this or it might be one of the weights of the symmetric power. So that's the, uh, that's the kind of crucial case, but everything else is completely clear. So this is the case where... Uh, alpha is lambda plus i alpha r minus alpha s. So in this case, you push down from alpha, and you're in the lambda weight space, and there's a possibility of picking up an element, a multiple of v infinity in that case. So let's call that y r s sub i. Small y here and big y over there. So what we do is to pick up a huge collection of scalars. Collection of scalars. Y, R, S, I. <coughs> So if we fix R and S, then we call the sequence RSI an extension sequence. But we call all the data Y R S I an extension multi sequence. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, so uh, the next question is uh, simply, when does this sequence split? That's easy to fi figure out. So the extension dagger is split if and only if this uh, extension multi-sequence is a multiple of uh, what we call the standard multi-sequence. So that will be denoted Y standard RSI. And it's defined like this. <coughs> Lambda R plus I. Choose I. And I goes from 1 to lambda s. So that's the condition for this sequence to split. And you notice that the standard sequence is 0 sometimes. If and only if lambda is James. Now, the set of all multi sequences actually forms a vector space. You can add them and multiply by scalars. And this will be called E lambda, the space of all extension multi sequences. Or lambda. So this is basically the dimension of the X group, except that you have to in subtract one when there are standard sequences around. So you get that this X group Yes. Yes. Oh yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Well spotted. There is Y STD. Oh. That usually stands for something else. Anyway, right. <laughs> this is the dimension of E lambda if lambda is James, because there's no standard sequence in that case, or it's zero. Or it's the dimension of E lambda minus one if lambda is not James. Yes, okay, the dimension of that is very good. Thank you, Steve. Let's, no, let's keep me honest. Okay, so that's good. But it's all a bit formal. So the next problem is to identify the conditions that define an extension sequence. Y R S I. 
to be an extension multi-sequence. And after that, of course, but this is, uh, this is not my job, this is Harry's job, is to um, describe all of these multi-sequences. So these are coming from the uh, relations among the divided powers operators. So I can tell you the easiest case. So of course, even for fixed R and S, the X R the Y, sorry, Y R S I are related. Well, that's just because in this root subgroup, if you multiply two elements together, you get U plus U dashed. So this translates into the condition that YRSI, YRSJ is I plus J choose I, YRS, I plus J. <coughs> so this implies, this in turn, XI just to be R, S, I, so the R and S are fixed. This, uh, tr this gives, well, it's a direct translation. Uh, to the condition that A plus I plus J choose J, X, I is I plus J choose I, X, I plus J. Whenever I plus J is less than or equal to B, and I have to tell you that in this case A is lambda R and B is lambda S. <laughs> Okay, so before proceeding to find all possible multi-sequences, we should start with this fixed sequence and find all the solutions. And it's uh, possible to do that, so I'll tell you what the solutions are. Well, this pair could be, it could be James. In which case, there is a sp one dimensional space of solution. So you write out B in its base P expansion. B to the beta, P to the beta, base P with B beta non zero. <coughs> then there's a solution, X P to the beta equals two, X two P to the beta equals <coughs> blah, 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 equals beta X beta P to the beta. And all other terms zero. So this is a one-dimensional space of uh, solutions. There is a second case where you get something interesting.
This we call the pointed case. And uh, this means that B is some B hat plus P to the beta, where B hat is less than P to the valuation of A plus 1 is less than P to the beta. That's the case we call pointed. And we call it uh, pointed because in this case there exists the point solution. Which is just xp to the beta is 1 and all the other xi is equal to 0. So there's that solution. But remember, there's also the standard solutions and the standard solutions. They don't exist in the first case because that's the James case where the standard solution is identically zero. In all of the cases, there is only the multiples of the standard solution. That's the case where the sequence split is only the standard solution. Multiples of multiples of the standard solution. So that is at the uh, very beginning of the analysis, but it's already enough to do GL two. But of course, GL two was done a long time ago by Karen, uh, but this is enough to recover. Extensions for uh, of vial modules for SL2. That's what it corresponds to, this uh, just case where you only have an R and an S. That would be the case if you had GL2 in particular. You could only have R is equal to 1 and S is equal to 2. And so you would be getting all the extensions by these kind of basic extension sequences. Well, that's um, really all I wanted to say about the first bit. However, I do have a few minutes left, so uh, I can't resist showing how this method gives a very easy proof of uh, James's result, which is a degree zero. So in this case, what we're really doing is looking at the, well, we are looking at the fixed points and we might as well be looking at the Homs from SDE to K lambda. <coughs> so if you have a B module, U, you can take the largest trivial quotient as a U-module, then the B-homomorphisms well, that's just the lambda weight space of this. Yeah, uh, yes, a B-module M, thank you. And U is the unipotent radical of B. Okay, so maybe I'm not going to succeed. <clears throat> anyway, you just apply this to uh, the symmetric power.
And what you have to do to form this is uh, take SDE and factor out by all of the uh, divided powers operators acting on it to make the quotient trivial. But in fact, you only need R and R plus 1. because these generate everything. <coughs> so the question is, uh, how can there be an element of weight lambda? So only get E lambda non-zero in the quotient if you never get it from something bigger by these operators. And the condition that you never get it uh, from something bigger is, uh, OK, so if, if when we write down this from something bigger, This would have to be zero. Otherwise, you would, it would, it would be, represent zero in the quotient. And so this is uh, if and only if, because of the formulas we had before, if and only if lambda r plus i, choose i, is zero, mod p for all i. That's if and only if lambda is James. And of course, it can't be more than one dimensional because there's only one dimensional weight space of lambda in the symmetric power anyway. Right, thank you. I'll, I'll stop there. H1B, G. H1G, yes. Oh, oh, I see. You're right. Right. No, no. That, we're using the very strong properties about the symmetric power. Possibly, but uh, we prefer not to. I mean, take the uh, James's result. You can either thrash around with Tableau for a few pages, or there's this e very easy argument here. So, yeah, you can do that probably, but we prefer not to. Uh, well, you're asking the wrong person, I think. <laughs> yes. 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 No, 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 all of them, because uh, you recover the GLN situation. You can always remove enough determinants to make what, the thing on the left the symmetric power. Uh, possibly, but I think after this eight months of staring at this, we're just so exhausted that um, we'd rather not. <laughs> Please feel free to have a go. I mean. <laughs>